yeah, so I've been told to speak to you as if you had no background in physics, no background in, you know, high level maths, no PhDs in statistics. Um, so doing so will probably involve me missing the mark sometimes. So please don't be shy and putting your hand up and telling me I'm pitching at the wrong level, but I'm kind of thinking of this more as like an introduction to the ideas. You know, if you've never studied time series or you've never studied complex physical systems before, what are the sorts of ideas and tools that exist and approaches for extracting structure or finding patterns or measuring them uh, in these data in a way that's as accessible as possible? And then you can collaborate with someone or spend the time to dig deeper in the literatures. But at least my goal is that you'll have some broad understanding of, of how you might go about doing, doing that sort of thing. And I'll focus on uh, being an egotistical researcher. I'm currently writing a fellowship. And I'm in that mode of like, everything has to be about me. And tomorrow, after I've submitted the fellowship, I can go back to normal, um, a normal, sane human being. But I focused on my own work in this presentation. I guess that's normal. But... OK, so this is the kind of uh, timeline on which we sit. Uh, that's me, you know, however many years ago, almost 15 years ago, where we started this work. Um, and then all the way through to building on it in the work that we do uh, now. So that's just to say this is a long kind of timeline of, of ideas of how we might uh, bring together a, a really diverse literature on people who study time series. And we'll see that coming forward. So when I say something like a complex system or a system that changes through time or a complex dynamical system, um, there are different ways that you might think about such a system. A physicist tends to think, you know, everything has to be simple. So we just make a, a rectangle or a sphere or some, a simple geometric shape. And we think about every point uh, in that uh, physical space uh, changing through time. What's called a field. Someone in engineering normally thinks about different parts of a system as nodes, like you're routing modems in the internet or you're clicking between hyperlinks on a web page. You go from that web page to that web page. Um, or these could be neurons in the worm's brain. You've got that worm and that neuron in its head and that neuron in its body, and they're sending messages to each other and their activity is changing over time. So, in general, you'll have different parts of your system. Let's say there are just four parts in a very simple case. In this case, there are inf infinitely many parts. Every piece on this uh, rectangle changes through time. Um, but the point that we're trying to get at is how do we quantify the structure in what looks like a complex uh, set of interacting components? And so this problem is generically studied in many different disciplines. People measure data from systems that change in time. Stated that abstractly, this is an extremely fundamental problem. We're probably used to measuring, you know, size. I don't know what people in geoscience study, but maybe earthquakes, maybe um, other mineral deposits changing in space and time, or I assume things are changing in space and or time. Uh, and therefore you'd be measuring these types of data, but they're very general. People who study stock markets or try and predict stock markets or inflation, they're dealing with you know, unemployment figures changing through time. People who are trying to diagnose sleep disorders are dealing with measurements of the brain in space and time. Uh, and people who are trying and predict or discover if something's an earthquake or was an explosion from measuring a seismogram or something like that uh, are also dealing with this same problem. So it's a very general scientific problem. And therefore the, the set of methods that we've developed to analyze such data is very broad. The people in heart rate analysis who are trying to find congestive heart heartbeats have their own set of methods for doing that. People in seismology who are trying to distinguish different types of earthquakes or explosions have their own methods. So it's a very interdisciplinary uh, field, both in the types of, and structure of data, types of questions people ask about it, and the types of methods that have been developed uh, to analyze it. And so I'm going to take uh, a very simplistic approach and focus on this part today. Um, so, you know, I've, I've set up the problem in a really general way. 
you've got lots of different, you know, something like this. You've measured lots of different parts of your system. They're all changing through time. That example there is um, someone with their eyes uh, open uh, during a seizure. Uh, and you've measured from a part of the brain that's not part of a seizure. And so you've got all these different parts of the brain that are varying through time. A very simple approach is to zoom in on one of those pieces. And what about the piece in this bit of the brain only? Like zoom in on that, then we've just got a single time series and we can see what measures of structure can we get from that. Like a seismogram, you could measure it everywhere. You know, after an explosion or something, you could measure um, the deviation all across the world. But what if we just pick one location near the site? We just get a single thing varying through time. But I note that you can also, a lot of people care about interactions between the parts, say in the brain. How does the front of the brain connect, uh, send information to the back of the brain? So there you're looking at pairs. And what can I learn about the dependency between that part and that part just by look, measuring data from both? Uh, we look at cross correlations and other types of dependent structures. And then there's even more zoomed out. How does this network of things interact more broadly? But today I'm going to focus on this zoom in on a single piece of the system. So we just get a single time series. Uh, and what can we do with it? So, what is a time series? Uh, this is uh, what we're going to play with today. And I'll think of this simplistic case where you're measuring it at a uh, constant sampling rate. So you measure it now, you wait a bit of time, you measure it again, you wait a bit of time, measure it again, measure it again, measure it again, measure it again. So that delta T I've got there is just that interval in time between your successive measurements. So EEG, you might measure a thousand times a second for brain activity. Measure it, measure it, measure it, measure it. And from measuring it again and again and again, you can piece together what's called a time series, which is that ordered set of measurements over time. So what was it now? Write down the number. What was it at the next point in time? Write down the number. What was it at the next point in time? Write down the number. And you can piece together a long set of numbers that capture the dynamics of your process. And so, as I mentioned, this is done in all these different areas. And a problem that we're not going to talk about today is time series forecasting. This is a very common problem. A lot of people, when they hear time series analysis, they think of the forecasting problem. And this is the problem. So you've measured data at some set of time, and you're here, and you want to make a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. This is common in industry where people want to predict you know, housing prices or inflation rates or uh, unemployment data or energy demand so they can uh, make sure there's enough energy that's needed at different parts of the day uh, for marketing or for predicting how many shoes am I going to sell in my store in April so that I can get the bright shipments in. And a lot of industry cares about this predicting the future. Uh, but the problem we're going to focus more on today is this setting of time series analysis, where we want to distinguish or find patterns in data that tells us something about um, differences between different types of processes. So here's a classic depiction of, of what's called the classification problem. So the problem is, is shown here. We've got a new time series up the top that's come from a recording of someone's brain. And we want an algorithm that tells us, was did that person have their eyes open or did that person, is that person having a seizure say? And we want an algorithm that can accurately do that by learning the patterns in examples of time series that we've told it a seizure and examples of time series that we've told it our eyes open. And when we get a new piece of time series coming in, we want to be able to detect, are they having a seizure? Is their eyes open? Uh, we want to do that as accurately as possible. And also, if possible, to try and understand why. What's the difference between the patterns during seizure and eyes open? If we can understand that, that can help guide us um, to uh, understanding the system as well. Does that make sense? So far? All right, so I'm going to focus on, uh, on this kind of philosophy uh, of tackling this type of problem. Uh, and this is a really old quote. 
um, but it comes from you know a lot of a lot of recent approaches to statistical learning are focused on more and more complex uh, models so these big nonlinear models neural networks uh, these types of things that are very hard to understand but maybe they perform really well but as scientists typically we prefer understanding even if it comes at a performance cost so you can have you can imagine a really suboptimal space in which to put your data and then you have to fit a really complex model to find the differences. Our approach is more, how can we understand and put it in a good space where a simple model will do well? So a lot of computer science is focused on making more and more sophisticated algorithms. We're focused on understanding, uh, which requires simplicity because human brains uh, are not as good as computers at these things. Um, okay, so. Like I said, we're going to zoom in on this single time series. How can we quantify patterns in it? So in the back of your mind, you should be thinking, you know, I want to classify this as seizure or eyes open, or I want to classify this as an earthquake or a, uh, what's the other thing that happened? Explosion. That was a classic time series problem. Do you know that one? Where they measure a seismogram and they want to know, has someone just set off a bomb near me or is it just a tremor? How do you distinguish that? Okay, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit again uh, and mention, just give you a depiction of all the different types of people and scientists across different fields and industries that measure uh, time series. So you've got people, I don't know how many of these resonate with you, but people in kind of ecology measuring um, populations of zooplankton over time people in uh, astrophysics trying to capture the position of satellites through time, audio is a time series, a lot of people doing speech recognition and problems like that deal with these types of things. A lot of people in mathematics and statistics study uh, nonlinear systems and chaos uh, in general. And then you've got people measuring rainfall and all sorts of trying to forecast oil prices to make rich people richer and all sorts of other problems and so all of these uh, in all of these settings we often want to reduce what looks like a really complex pattern like this right? how do you go about extracting something interpretable from that so this is the generic uh, situation that i'm going to focus on today how do we turn this complex stream of measurements through time into a single real number it's just a, you know, you know what a real number a number that can tell us something about the structure in the data. So where do you start, right? You've got this big thing moving around, some oscillations there, a bit of drift in the baseline. You've got this thing jumping from two different states. You've got this thing kind of moving up and down, all these chaotic nonlinear patterns. Uh, how do you start, uh, start going about this pro problem? And here are some classic say six classic examples of time series features that give us a number and that number tells us something about the dynamics that we can learn and interpret. Um, so I'll focus on the pictures, I think, but um, you know, you could ask questions like how fast is the thing varying? Is something that varies kind of slowly different to something that varies really fast? That's a really generic question you could ask and there are mathematical ways to quantify that. How variable is it? There's something that varies off the charts, different to something that just varies in a little timid way. That's a really classic, something like the standard deviation of the data would capture that sort of property. How well correlated is it through time? So that's question says, if I look at my process, you know, a minute in the past, is that a good predictor of what it is now? And if that's a good predictor, that means it's varying slowly in a way that's easy to predict. Uh, more generally, we could ask that question in a nonlinear way. So if I make a really complex nonlinear model of my data, how well does it help me predict uh, the future of that process? Uh, and how stationary is it? If I look at the statistical properties in say the first half, are they different to the properties in the second half? There are all these different types of interpretable questions that you can ask and scientists have come up with mathematical ways to capture the essence of that question in a that gives a real number that you can interpret 
and it will say this one varies fast, this one very slow. This one is highly variable, this one is not very variable in a way that we can quantify. Uh, and these are some pictures of that. Like in, if you look at the distribution, you might go, how many outliers are there? Uh, is it multimodal? Is it Gaussian? Uh, all sorts of different questions like that. This may seem intractable because I've just said there's so many different things. How do you pick which one of these things to, to invoke or to calculate when you're solving a general problem like explosion versus earthquake or, you know, uh, eyes open to see. This is the question when someone sits down at their computer, uh, in this case, quite an old computer, and says, uh, what methods should I use for this problem that someone's just come in my door and asked me to solve? It's, a, it's an art. This is a subjective process. If you give it to a different scientist, they may pick a different method. They may have a different process. And so often it'll be, oh, I trained in this. I'm going to try and put every problem through this uh, same process that I studied in my PhD, and that's going to be my career in science. Or you might go, oh, everyone in my field does this, right? Whenever we get, you know, heart rate data, we always use this method. It's just what we do. Or, oh, there's this brand new method. It's a big hot trend. I'm going to apply this new method and we'll get a big high impact paper out of it. But each of those ways of, of selecting a method is subjective. And it's hard to then assess if progress is being made, right? If one person would have tried this method and got this result, the next person you ask tried a different method, got a different result. How can you assess if any one paper, scientific paper that handpicked a method, whether that method was uniquely useful or whether a different method would have outperformed it, etc. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so in this setting, I'm imagining there's a problem with a quantifiable performance, like how accurately do I distinguish earthquake from experiments? An explosion. Well, I'll I'll make this more concrete later with some specific example. But the generic theme of that is that it's it's a subjective process to pick all of these different things that I could quantify about a time series. Any specific analysis, uh, data analysis, researcher has to make a selection from all those options. And so that some of the work that we did. Uh, which is this package, software package called uh, HCTSA. And the, the philosophy is to be highly comparative. So rather than just handpicking manually a method that may be of interest, the idea is that we compare as many different methods as possible. So we compare in a highly, compare, compare highly, uh, that doesn't work in that sentence, um, many different possible methods that we could have used and then see which ones work well. So this was me sitting in a dark room for a year or so during my PhD, just like, right, this week we're going to do hidden Markov models. Next week we're going to do state space. Next week we're going to do... And so I implemented these uh, 7,000 different uh, features, slowly losing my sanity, which I'm still working to recover. Um, I mean, often it derived from existing toolboxes. I didn't come up with all these things, uh, but it is now in one place such that uh, the researcher no longer needs to go through this subjective manual process in which you never know if the method that you used was the best possible method, or if you could have found a simpler one that did better, uh, if it gave more interpretation or all these things. But if you actually compare as many possible things from different literatures, some of these things came from economics. Some of these methods come from heart rate analysis. Some of these are from astronomy, etc. You can apply all these different methods and go, oh, that one works well on my data. That one works well on my data. Let's use that one. So it brings a kind of systematic process to selecting what methods uh, will be useful for solving the problem that you define. And again, that has to be that has to be given. You have to know what sort of problem. Uh, and define a good versus bad. 
Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. I mean, for something that's about a thousand long, this takes maybe 30 seconds per time series. So it's not exhaustive. It doesn't prevent, it would need to be a massive data set of really long recordings for this to, to prevent you uh, doing it. Okay, so this is a busy slide, but this is uh, gets to the essence of the idea. Uh, we'll pick one of these. Maybe we pick Parkinson's versus healthy control. So this was a problem where Vodafone in the UK wanted to spy on the uh, phone calls of the customers. Uh, but of course, when big companies do something like that, they always have a good uh, motive in mind. You know? Companies would never act against the interests of their customers because ethics is central to what modern capitalism is all about. Uh, and in this case, there's no exception because their goal was to try and find patterns in the audio of people talking that might predict whether they're going to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the next five or 10 years. So they would spy on you uh, and then send you a little message going, oh, you should get checked for, you should go to this doctor because we think you're at high risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And if you get treatment early, it might prevent you know, major um, you know, irreversible uh, damage. So this is the problem. And but, you know, this problem comes up in many different settings, but I focus on this one. So imagine that all these blue time series here is audio from people with uh, Parkinson's and then all the red is audio from phone calls of people who are healthy controls. Your goal is to distinguish the two. So you get a new piece of phone recording and you go, is this person likely to develop Parkinson's disease say, or are they going to be healthy? You could imagine whatever geoscience setting that you think about. Is this the position of where copper deposits are likely to be in the world and your earth by whatever model is, I don't know, something, whatever you, whatever setting uh, makes you comfortable. Uh, and then, so the approach here is that we extract thousands of different methods. So every column in this table here is a different one of these statistics that we could take from the time series. And I've said, did we get a high value for that statistic or a low value for both classes of data. So here we've got lots of white. That means the time series here from the Parkinson's disease had really high values for these methods, probably thousands of different methods in these columns. And these time series had lower values for those, uh, those methods in the table in the type B in a healthy recording. So you can see here, instead of just focusing on a table that has three two or three methods in the columns. Uh, it could be standard deviation of the time series, autocorrelation, how fast or slow is it varying. They could be the first three columns. A normal scientist would do that manually, right? They'd pick those two or three methods, make their table with those two or three columns and measure those numbers for all the different time series and see which of them differs between Parkinson's and uh, healthy. And so the difference with our approach is Instead of two or three columns in Excel, you just expand this out with as many possible methods as you can deal with. And the idea is that those different methods draw on different parts of the scientific literature, methods from medicine, methods from astrophysics, maths, etc. And it's not just a big black box statistical thing because each one of these columns is an interpretable scientific method. So when you find a column that does really well, tells you about what's different. Uh, the entropy or nonlinear predictability of Parkinson's disease is higher than healthy, say. So it takes you back to a part of the scientific literature that you can use to then extract interpretable understanding about your data. Okay, so this is the setting that I've shown. Okay. 
and this has been used for many different problems across science. We did it to find differences in, say, uh, fetuses during labor. Are they still fetuses? They're babies at that stage. Um, and should you intervene? It's a dangerous thing to intervene during labor, but if the data is telling you the baby's under strife, you may need to take that risk in order to save the baby's life. That's a really subjective process. They just look at this noisy recording and different doctors will make different decisions. And when they make the wrong one, there are huge lawsuits and you know extreme tragedy. Um, so that's the process in which we want to extract patterns that could make that decision better and more reliable. I work a lot in neuroscience. So I'm thinking about the types of dynamical structures that happen uh, in mouse and human brains, how uh, different patterns of connectivity relate to different properties of dynamics. Uh, there's some work where they'll you know, manipulate different parts of the brain and see how the rest of the brain responds uh, in the mouse. From that, we can learn how properties of the microstructure of neural circuits shape the whole macrostructure of brain dynamics in ways that we could try and image human patients and understand what's happening at the micro level. And other fun ones like uh, the Parkinson's speech or the distinguishing whether a German actor is happy or sad uh, from its audio. And then other people have used this uh, in all sorts of other settings. Um, so these are just a few examples of other people using this approach to distinguish whether from measuring the energy smart meter, someone's running a vacuum or a microwave in the house, or you know, what's this one? Is someone making different gestures with their hands based on uh, smartwatch accelerometer data? So people have used this approach for many different problems. Okay, and here's a case study that that will kind of demonstrate some of the uh, some of the use of this approach. So read this black box here. So this paper was tackling the same classification problem I mentioned earlier. Can I distinguish time series during a seizure from time series when there's no seizure from the brain? And they published this paper with uh, words that would be complex, that sound, make it sound complex and smart and sophisticated, right? They used discrete wave plot transform features with independent component analysis, radial basis function kernels uh, for an SVM. And then the year later, they added a deep neural network layer to it. And they kept kind of getting this from 98 to 99 to whatever percent accuracy. And then they make really strong claims and get really highly cited papers. They go, oh, we're getting 98% accuracy at seizure detection. You should put this really complex method into clinical practice. Remember before I said that when you read a paper like that, those methods were selected as an art. Right? They gave the data to someone, they selected a set of methods, then you publish a paper using those methods. And so you never really know, is that a uniquely useful way of doing this problem? Would simpler methods have done better? And when we compared all the different methods, you can see here that you know what a high school student might have done, right? the very first thing you, you learn about, standard deviation, how wide is the distribution of values, that's already perfectly distinguishing the no seizure from the seizure. You put a line here and say, under that, no seizure, over that, seizure, you get 100% accuracy. So you read the paper and everyone bought this. Over 600 people thought, oh yeah, we need deep neural networks with wavelets and ICA, RBF kernels. But the problem was extremely simple, such that you give that to a year 10 high school statistics class and they would do just as well. And so this really demonstrates uh, that point I was making before that it's very hard to assess progress when methods are done without comparison. And it's hard as a reviewer to point in this yellow box here to go, oh, why didn't you try this? Why didn't you try that? When there are thousands of different things to try, you go, oh, just let it through. They've chosen this, it does well. That's a piece of science. 
but it's very hard to, as a reader, assess whether that really is a breakthrough or whether they've overcomplicated what's a simple problem by jumping on the kind of latest trends in neural networks and wavelets and whatever. And so I think it's important now that we have this mechanism to compare thousands of different methods through the tools that we've developed that um, we can now make that easy for authors to go, we've chosen this method, how does that compare to at least a simple comparison of alternative measures? Uh, and you can now do that through the, the software we developed. I think I'll talk about other scientific examples. We've done sleep stuff. Ah, I might talk about this one. So yeah, someone mentioned earlier that you know, 7,000 things is a lot. It's complex, you know, a lot of these things, a lot of these 7,000 things are not different to each other. Like if you look at these columns here, it's probably 500 different methods and they're all doing about the same thing, right? They give low values here, they all give high values here, they all give low values here again. You know, they're not doing 7,000 different things. A lot of them are doing a similar thing to each other. So can we reduce that 7,000 down to a smaller number that still captures the diversity of different methods that scientists have developed, but reduces the computation time and complexity and cuts down on some of the redundancy across different scientific approaches? Yeah, the makeup of the library, if you're doing some form of low dimensional construction like TCA or something, that will be biased towards the methods that are overrepresented in a way that could be good or could be bad, but is often bad. Okay, so is, is it too many? Yes. And so we tested on these 100 different, uh, 93 different uh, tasks and we found that you know you can yeah you know, the further the more features you include the better your accuracy will be but if you cut down from 7,000 extreme cut down right 7,000 to 20 you're only losing on average about eight percent of accuracy with what is a massive reduction from calculating 7,000 things on a supercomputer to calculating 20 things in a millisecond on your laptop Uh, these are there was a process through which we tried to find the best 20. Is there another question? No. Okay. So this is the we it ended up the procedure we ran ended up getting 22. Uh, and we called this one catch 22. And it you can see up in the top there uh, A that is the 7,000 better or is the 22 better? For most problems, the 7,000 is better, but it's not a big difference. And when we coded those features in you know, a really fundamental programming language called C, um, they run really fast. So they go from taking you know, hundreds of seconds for a 10,000 long time series down to less than a second for the same really long complex time series. Uh, and you can see the scaling there. For something just 100 long, it takes a millisecond. And it computes all these different statistics of nonlinear properties, linear properties, other types of statistics, long range scaling, how big are the outliers, where's the mode. So it captures the flavor of all the different methods that are in the full set, but cuts out some of the redundancy and runs a lot faster. And on average, you'll only lose, say, 8% of accuracy. So if you just want to get a handle on it, this is a good place to start. And if you really care about maximizing accuracy, you could later scale up to the full set to see if you're missing something that's not in this subset. And this subset has also been used. Um, this has been more common in industry because it's really fast to run. We've got packages in Python, R, and Julia, and MATLAB. So all the main data science languages uh, have native access to this set. 
uh, and it runs really fast. And people have used it for wearables and all sorts of things like that. Um, we're not the only people to have developed feature sets in the last, say, three or four years. People have jumped on this bandwagon. Um, so Facebook released a set called Cat. Um, there's some classic R ones, like TS Features was really popular back in the day. It's more based around ec econometric uh, feature, time series features. When I say feature, I just mean that real number that you get to extract from the time series. Um, and then some recent Python ones that have got like, you know, 10,000 downloads a day, some of these, because Python's such a massive language for data science these days, and a lot of modern problems in, in industry involve time series. And so we've got done some work benchmarking them all against each other, which ones are fast, which ones are accurate, uh, etc. And then if you want to just uh, access these open access, uh, time series features, my PhD student recently made this R package for doing that, if you're an R user. And I'll really quickly mention zooming out to pairs. I told you I'd focus just on an individual, but a lot of people care about interactions between system. I don't know if that happens a lot in geo, but you know, just to mention it again, it's the same type of problem. A lot of people will pick a method for measuring the dependence between two time series. So they do Granger causality, transfer entropy. I don't know if you've heard of these terms, correlation, cross-correlation. There are many different ones. And then we also made a package that assembles all of those methods, about 250 different methods, um, and allows you to compute all of them and compare them to your problem. Okay, I won't say more about that, given the time, but this is a summary of the tools that we've developed. So there's this HCTSA uh, that has the 7,000 different features. That's a MATLAB one. Uh, Trent's uh, R thing that uh, does the same type of analysis from feature extraction to statistical learning and visualization. Both of those do that whole pipeline from input data through to um, statistical algorithm and analysis. And then we have this one for pairs, and then this really fast one that's native in Python, Julia, and, and R with just the 22. I would always recommend starting with this just because it runs so quickly and you can get a, a feel for your, for your data set. I've got, uh, I'll mention this, I want to leave some time for questions, but I'll mention this that because what we what we developed, you could think of as turning a time series into a set of features, a little barcode. What did you get for feature one? What did you get for feature two? So you can represent a time series with this little set of numbers. And what that does is allow us to compare those sets of numbers to say, is this, two, is this pair of time series similar to each other? Or is this two pair of time series similar or different? And in so doing, we can organize this big interdisciplinary literature of time series that I mentioned. So this is a website we developed where you can drag your own data onto it and it will find matches across 30,000 other time series from rainfall to economics to this uh, audio from Sigur Ross in this case, an old classic. Um, and it will show you all the different most similar time series and say, oh, I've dragged this data on and it might pull up and you might drag that on and it pulls up all these matches and tells you, oh, that time series was developed from this model. You should talk to the statistician who's an expert in that model. Or this is really similar to a data measured in astrophysics. You should read that paper and maybe you could learn from them. And so the aim is to kind of bring different scientists together through common structure in their data. All right. So I'll leave 10 minutes for quick. Yeah. So a lot of this work was done. Um, all the way back, as I showed you on the timeline, over 10 years ago, but it's still going. It's been starting here a few years ago. I've kind of built some PhD students who are still plugging away at um, time series analysis. Uh, some who are more interested in clinical applications or applications in fundamental neuroscience, but others who are developing uh, general tools for doing time series analysis more efficiently 
uh, in a way that draws on this big literature of possible methods. Um, so hopefully that gave you a, an understanding of, of the problem and the different ways that you could tackle time series. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions.